observance day, on the 30th of November 2020, a Monday. It's a day that uh, the monks, novices, lay people have come together to practice. It's also a special occasion for the monks in that we gather to listen to the Vinaya, our monastic code. It comprises um, the main body of this is the 227 uh, rules, which uh, composes the Patimoka. So this is the means that we have to um, gain control over our bodies and our speech, and to um, gather them into an orderly fashion. And just like if there are many flowers uh, that have gathered together from many different uh, species of plants, and someone who had skill uh, were to come with a thread and uh, organize those flowers to make them into a garland so that they could offer that beautiful flower arrangement uh, to the Buddha in homage of the Buddha. And it's the same for us monks that we have come together from many different countries, many different ethnicities. Um, but we all gather together in this one vinya, this one monastic code. Um, so the main body is the patimoka, and this word patimoka, we can split it into pati, which means the opening, um, or the mouth, and moka, which means freedom. And so it's the opening to freedom. So when we practice in the Dhamma and the Vinaya, um, that's this path of dana, sila, bhavana, generosity of morality, virtue, and of the cultivation of the heart. So this aspect of virtue, um, there can be many different precepts that we can take. The five precepts, the eight precepts, ten precepts. With the ten precepts, there are nuns who can keep this, and also the novices keep this as well. And for the monks, they keep um, the Patimoka rules, the 227 precepts. But outside of the Patimoka, there are many, many rules as well, um, which uh, allow the monks to live together in an orderly fashion. And the duties that we have towards our teachers, that we have towards visiting monks, for instance, the duties of an abbot, the duties that the monks have towards each other, and duties that we have in the dying shed. And there are many different uh, aspects which are all there for us to keep a sense of order and structure, for us to live our lives in harmony in a beautiful way. So the monks have these 227 rules, um, but we can um, take these down to just the five precepts. And really these five precepts form the basis of virtue, because those who keep these five precepts are able to attain to the level of sotapanna or sakadagami. For those who keep the eight precepts, it's possible to attain to anagami. And for the 227 precepts, they can take all the way to arahantship. But also these other levels, or the lower levels of, the lesser levels of precepts, um, they don't block off the path to arahantship either. So it's possible for a nun to become an arahant, and this has happened before. So some monks um, or nuns, they can uh, reach this level of purity in the heart, they can attain to liberation. And externally, um, the nun who is liberated may sit on the lower seat to the monks, but internally, their mind is bright and pure, the mind of an arahant. So we need, on the external level, we do need this form that we keep, and a sense of order, uh, because we live together in society, and we need um, harmony in our abiding together. 
But if we're taking it on the level of internal purity, um, then it's fine for a nun who's an arahant to be sitting on the same level as a monk. So for the monastics, it's important to really set our hearts on this practice. And Lumpur Man and Lumpur Cha you both emphasize um, restraint for the monks and being cautious and practicing, cultivating the mind. Having sila as the foundation of our practice and, on our, and of our lives as well. And the foundation of sila is our intention. Whether our intention is pure or not pure, and that we can know, and that affects the purity of our sila. So when we train with this, um, then the practice of sila will relieve us of anxieties that we have. But in training in virtue, we do need to understand the meaning of it. The meaning is to allow us to become peaceful, to stop the mind from getting stirred up and chaotic. And through this, knowledge and understanding is able to arise. Wisdom can come up in our hearts. And so sila has many benefits, and mostly that of developing samadhi. Samadhi, in turn, gives rise to wisdom. And through this, vimuti, liberation, can arise. But all of this requires virtue as its foundation. Because if the mind is not peaceful, um, then uh, what that shows is that we're not gaining much control over our body and of our speech as well. It's the nature of our minds that at times they'll have very strong greed, hatred and delusion. But even though these defilements are present, we do need to work against them and suppress them, and we suppress them through the sila. Even though the mind is very chaotic and stirred up, we need to train, we need to train ourselves in samadhi. And when we get a foundation of the collectiveness of mind, um, then our practice of sila and our understanding of virtue will grow. We'll be able to let go more. Um, but if we care or look after our sila um, through the thoughts of such as not wanting to kill anything at all, then this can bring us quite a lot of difficulty. So one of the awakened teachers said that well, if there's a path and it's just full of ants, then what are you going to do? Well, you need to walk along that path. And so you just consider that you're just walking on the earth. You're not walking on the ants. If we walk in this way, then it's possible to experience peace um, as we're going along. That we don't have the intention to kill, but we also accept that through our actions, maybe some animals will die. So in thinking this way, it can relieve our hearts of anxiety because we are aware that we don't have the intention to harm any beings. So in the beginning, however, when we are taking care and developing this practice of sila, and we need to build this on a foundation of kindness and compassion. And that we don't wish for any animals to die. And we do our best um, so that they don't come to any harm. So when we gain an understanding of sila, then it makes our practice go more smoothly. But in the beginning, um, this taking care of our precepts is something that's quite difficult. Trying to maintain all of them so that they're pure is hard. But we do this for the arising of samadhi. The mind may be quite um, stirred up uh, through trying to keep our sila well, but we still need to try our best. We still need to train ourselves in this. And eventually, as we carry on, we'll gain a deeper understanding into the meaning of what it is to look after sila. So there's one of the 
rules, one of the defeats, offenses for a monk, the Parajika, is that of not claiming any um, higher state that they haven't actually attained to. And so at Wat Nambapong, Lumpur Chao's monastery, monks just wouldn't talk about any of these higher abilities, any of these supranormal attainments, because they were afraid that they'd be very close to committing this offense. So any claims of jhana or of gaining the divine ear or the divine eye, um, no one would speak of these. Because if they did, maybe in the future, they'd get worried about what they said. Sometimes it's possible for a monk to believe that they've attained to one of these states, and maybe they tell someone else about it. But later on, they realize they hadn't actually attained to that, and that can really make their minds a mess. There was one monk who was working all day and he felt very thirsty and very hungry out of energy. And he saw a bottle of honey outside his teacher's hut. And so he took that honey and he drank some of it. A long time after that happened, he was meditating and he recollected that event. And he started thinking, well, maybe I've fallen into one of these defeat offenses. Maybe I'm not actually a monk anymore because I stole that honey. I didn't ask for it. I didn't tell anyone. And he wasn't able to resolve um, this emotion. So it was his karma coming back to him at that time. He was afraid that he was no longer a monk anymore. So we don't really need to be careful about this. We need to be cautious. Um, and if we're going to take anything that belongs to the community as a whole, we do need to tell others about it. So like the offerings that are given um, to the community, um, they will need to be gathered together into the storeroom. And then from that, they can be shared out. If we want um, something, then we can tell our teacher and or ask for it. Um, but we shouldn't just take it by ourselves. It's not correct uh, to be doing that. And so there's a monk who's in charge of these things, and uh, we need to follow the order that's been established. Um, and so the, the teacher and the monk in charge, they're not attached to these things. They're not um, clinging to these offerings. Uh, but we do need a sense of order um, within our community. Because perhaps if we take them without asking, then we may doubt ourselves later in the future and wonder if maybe we were actually stealing. So we do need to be cautious. And cautious within all the rules of our training in the Pedi Moka. So we have the four Parajikas, uh, the defeat offenses, and then the 13 Sangadisesas, the two Aniyata uh, offenses, and then the 30 Nisagiya Pachitiyas, the 92 Pachitiyas, the four Patidesaniya, and then the Sekiyas, and then the seven uh, Dikarana Samata Dhammas. And we need to train um, our minds and train our bodies in speech uh, to follow this. The sealer that we keep, it's like a seven-tiered uh, crystal wall that protects us. And especially for monks who are going wandering on Tudong, they need to have a well-established virtue to, to protect them. So there was once a monk, uh, Mbusi, who uh, was close to, he said close to Utaitani province. And uh, he was 126 years old at that time. And uh, he said that there were many Tudon monks uh, in that area who had died. And the reason that they had uh, died was because they didn't keep their virtue very well. And mostly they had passed away through elephants trampling on them. 
And it's also possible um, for monks who keep uh, their sila well to die through this means as well, if they have the karma um, behind them. And we've heard about this a lot in the past. And also in this year, there have been three monks who have died uh, from elephants uh, trampling on them. So we need to keep our seed as well, and we also need to have intelligence. Um, because uh, in order to save ourselves um, from these dangers, if we're going to go into a forest or go up, up into the hillside, uh, we need to be intelligent. We need to be able to chant the Metta Sutta, and also uh, the chant with uh, Apamano Buddha Dhammo Sangho as well. And train ourselves in this um, so that we can gain samadhi. And both the samadhi and these chants will help to protect ourselves. And because things aren't sure, that the danger is normal in this world. But if we have um, strong faith and we're well established in the Dhamma, then we'll be able to free ourselves from those dangers. There was one time when uh, a Tudong monk was in the forest and a, a bear attacked him and it uh, went to strike him with its paw. But just before the paw hit the monk, it suddenly stopped. And so this shows that the Dhamma was protecting that monk. There was us also another uh, great teacher who had a lot of mindfulness uh, about him. And he one day was sleeping, and he woke up, and a snake had... Uh, already swallowed his legs, a very large snake. And he told the snake that uh, what he really wanted was Nibbana. So if the snake, through eating him, was able to take him to Nibbana, then the snake was welcome to swallow him. Uh, but when the snake heard that, uh, it regurgitated his legs. So he was able to survive. Uh, because of his mindfulness and also because of the fearlessness that he had. He wasn't afraid of death, so he was able to escape from death. But if he had fear at that time, he probably would have died. It's also natural and for good monks that the devas will come to protect them as well. So we do need to have sincerity in our practice, seeing that um, our hearts are really important, and gaining samadhi within our minds, um, having this as the foundation of our hearts, is very important as well. So we need to have these chants going through our hearts um, very frequently in order to protect ourselves. There was one time at Wat Nambapong that in the evening, Nipucha gave a talk, and during this talk, um, he said that just the single syllable of na is enough to keep someone safe. I was listening to Nupucha say this, but I didn't think anything of it at the time. The next morning, I went off on arms round, and as I was coming back to the monastery, I was very close to the gate, and there was a herd of cows uh, that was walking along the path that went in front of the gate. And uh, I thought that I'd be able to cross that path and get into the monastery in time. But just as I started to walk in front of the herd, um, the cow herder, he, uh, maybe he didn't see me. And, or maybe he thought that he would get the herd uh, out of my way very quickly. So he, uh, he made the, the herd of cows uh, rush. So they started to run, and I was already walking in front of them. So I tried to walk even faster. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? Because I realized that I wasn't going to make it into the gate in time. I thought, well, these cows, they're probably going to trample over me. And if one hits me, then, and I fall over, then the rest are just going to step all over me. So what should I do? I then recollected what Lumpucha had told me, so I faced the cows, and I said the word na very loud. And then this herd of cows it broke um, into two packs, uh, 
which split around the side, uh, either side of me. And I was able to make it safely into the monastery after they passed. So if I hadn't um, recollected that teaching of Lumpur Cha, then perhaps I would have died. Or if not, I may have been crippled for the rest of my life. So it's important having um, a mind that's peaceful and also having a great teacher like this who is able to give us guidance. Because if he hadn't told me that, then I probably wouldn't have had enough mindfulness um, to have recollected one of these chants. That I already knew um, this one protective verse of Namo Buddhaya, but I probably wouldn't have remembered that in time. With this uh, protective word, um, it's able to keep us safe from dangers. So we should be chanting, recollecting the word Buddha or the word Nammu very frequently, having this there always in our hearts so that we can be safe and protected from dangers that arise. We gain protection through our sila as well and through the still heart that's in samadhi. And this then cultivates and develops into wisdom. But if we don't have these qualities, then that may lead to our deaths. So we need to chant to keep us safe. In the first year of this monastery, um, there were... <clears throat> so all of the huts um, had water tanks outside of them to collect water because uh, we were very short of water um, at that time. And so the monks needed to keep their roofs clean um, because that's where the water uh, flowed into the tanks from. So one monk one day went up to sweep his roof and it uh, started to rain. But while he was sweeping and cleaning the roof, he was chanting the Padimokha. And then suddenly the roof caved in. But he's very fortunate that his leg uh, managed to catch hold of one of the beams. And his head swung down. Um, but because his leg was still holding on, um, that broke his fall. And so it was kind of like he fell two times. That was the first time that he fell, but his leg held on. Uh, but then uh, it let go, and then he fell again. Uh, but that broke his fall. And so the Padimokha kept him safe uh, through that. So this Padimokha, it's the safe path to Nibbana. And it's also able to keep us protected in this world as well. So if, therefore, for us monks, um, those who can chant the Padimokha already, um, should carry on doing this and uh, maintain this chant. And for those who aren't able to do it yet, they should practice um, and recite it so that they're able to chant it, because it brings great benefit. As we're chanting the Padimokha, what we're doing is we're praising Sila. We're praising the Dhamma of the Buddha. So what this really means is that as we chant, we're praising the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And when we chant, we feel very still and peaceful. And those who listen, their minds rise up to the level of a deva. And the lay people who listen, they feel very energetic and uh, their hearts become refreshed. They gain an energy in their heart. And it's a very important energy. So today is the Lunar Observance Day and the people here of Lord Mabjan I can take a short break for now, and then we'll come together to chant uh, Etipiso 108 times. And so may everyone be sincere in this path of practice. <laughs>